still have folks coming in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, even with the, we, we, we have a skeleton crew today, I think, as expected. We have a lot of people traveling, a lot of people out this week. I know Sister Janie is at Shasta, and uh, Sister uh, Becky and Sister Watson, are they still in Red Bluff? Yeah, they're still in Red Bluff. So, um, but we're going to continue on, starting on time today, or as close to it as possible, and open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just lift our hearts to you this morning. Another Sunday, Lord God, we come into your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts, ready to give you praise, ready to worship your name, and ready to submit this time to you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you send your spirit down, Lord God, into this place, that you commune with us, Lord God, in a deeper and more intimate way, and that you fill our hearts with your wisdom and understanding, your love and your compassion, as you renew us in your spirit this morning. In your name we pray, amen.
just as we said last week how the children of Israel couldn't enter the temple willy-nilly, just any way they wanted to. They had to prepare their hearts. They had to prepare their bodies. They had to be cleansed, and they had to bring the sacrifice. This song reminds us that we want a fresh and clean anointing, a new anointing of the spirit of the living God. But in order to do that and let that spirit flow through us and use us, there is a melting, there is a molding, and there is a filling that has to take place. Don't you know it? We have to be prepared. Our hearts have to be right. And that's what that preparation time does. It molds us and melts us and fills us and makes room for that spirit of the living God to move through us. If you were here last week <clears throat> to hear the message of the, the tent of meeting and then Pastor uh, or Brother Galetta's word on top of that that focused so much on intimacy with the Lord. And what, and what a consistency there between those messages of, of the tent of meeting with the Lord and, and intimacy and, and the tent of meeting uh, discussion focused on those that didn't want to leave, the, those that wanted to stay in intimacy and stay in that meeting place with the Lord. And that is what we long for. And, and there's never been a more pressing time to be close to the Lord and to understand his heart for us and understand his heart for this body and then us individually. And that understanding is gained by dwelling with him. By, by seeking him daily in all things, the big things, the small things, and then just making space for him, being quiet, being near, and being open to him to, to touch your heart and to speak to you. And that's what we seek to do each and every week, that we gather to come and be still if we have to, or be quiet if we have to, wherever the Spirit leads to let him speak and let him move in our hearts and to, to fill us with his understanding of what he's doing in this time and what he's doing in our lives. Good morning, everybody. The second verse of that song says he wraps himself in light and the darkness has to flee. Amen? It doesn't say it in those exact words, but that's the gist. I hope you did have a wonderful 4th of July celebrating our freedoms and praying for those that we have lost or uh, about to lose. However, I want to give praise and acknowledgement to God for our Supreme Court this past week. It was announced, I believe there were three major, uh, major, what is it when they make a decision? Three major decisions in favor of religious freedoms. And I'm very thankful for that. It is um, sort of a, a buzz in the media now. How do they handle this? How do they present this? That, oh my goodness, our radical Supreme Court is ruling in favor of religion. Can you imagine? Thank God. We know that he is moving by his spirit. I want to talk of this morning Basically, the darker the day, the brighter his light shines. If that's the gist of my message. I won't be, I'll be talking about other things. But that's the overlying thought and message this morning, that the darkness is there. And it is a depressing uh, thought when you think about it. But if you stick around to the end, I think the light will shine forth. John 1, the Gospel of John, I'm only going to read one verse quickly there, and the Amplified Version says, The light shines on in the darkness, and the darkness did not understand it, it did not overpower it, it did not appropriate it, and it did not absorb it. Amen? And 
the light is unreceptive to the darkness. It can't be dispelled by the darkness. Amen. And Psalm 139.12 says that even the darkness is not dark to you, O Lord. It's no surprise to him. And it conceals nothing from you. But for us who do live in this darkness and must constantly battle it, we want to look at that and talk about that this morning because the Lord has given us the tools and he talks about multiple places in the Bible, how fragile this life is on earth. But have no fear because he has overcome this world. So if you would please turn to 2 Kings, the 20th chapter, we're going to look at a passage of scripture there. You may be familiar with this. We're going to talk about King Hezekiah. Now, the Bible says that he was a godly king, and he was in the prime of his life when he was in power over God's people. He was in power and authority, and yet... The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 20, 2 Kings, that Hezekiah became mortally ill. So God told the prophet Isaiah to warn the king to get his house in order because this illness was unto death and he was going to die and not live. So in verse 3, follow how, long, how quickly these things these things happen. So verse 2, we find in verse 1, he's ill. Verse 2, he's going to die. Verse 3, the king Hezekiah went to prayer immediately. And he said, O Lord, remember now, I beseech you, how I've walked before you in truth and with a whole heart, and how I have done what is good in your sight. And he wept bitterly. That's half the story in verse 1, 2, and 3. But look at verse 4. The prophet Isaiah had not even reached the middle of the king's courtyard after having delivered this message that he's going to die. And God spoke yet again to Isaiah and said, Turn around and go back to the king and tell him, I have heard his prayer, and I have seen his tears. And behold, in three days you're going to go into the temple healed, and I will grant you 15 more years of time on this earth. And the Lord promised that he would deliver Assyria into the hand of King Hezekiah. But notice this, he says, for my name's sake and for David's name's sake. This is why God chose to change his mind. But something very interesting happens next. Then the word of the Lord instructed the servants to make a poultice from a cake of figs. How many knew that figs had healing properties? I did not, but they do. You knew that, Patty, that figs are a healing property that God put on this earth. And he instructed Hezekiah's servants to make a poultice and put it on the boil. Most likely when you talk about boils, you think of blood poisoning because that Bacteria infection gets in the blood, and God told him how to get it out of his body and that he would recover. So the king asked the prophet. Now, in this, in this particular view, I would say that Hezekiah looks a bit like a ping pong ball. He's going to die. He's going to live. He's going to wait three days, and then he's going to go into the temple. And the king says to Isaiah the prophet, what will be the sign that the Lord will give me that he's going to do what he says he's going to do? What? Yeah, read it. <laughs> and he says, what will be the sign that I will go into the house of the Lord in three days? And what did the prophet say? 
Choose your sign. Do you want the Lord to move the sundial forward 10 steps or backwards 10 steps? And the king answered, it is the normal thing for the sundial to go forward. So I want it to go backwards 10 steps. And it did. God honored his request and he turned the dial back 10 degrees. Hezekiah was healed, and by the poultice of the figs and by the hand of God moving upon him through faith in his prayer, the Spirit of God moving upon Isaiah to deliver a hard message, but then the message caused Hezekiah to pray in faith. And Hezekiah challenged the decree of the prophet understand this he said i don't want to accept this that i'm going to die and not live and in faith he challenged the very prophet of god's words now we don't have much elaboration on the circumstances before hezekiah's illness nor those circumstances after he was healed and we don't have any insights into the actions or the state of mind or heart that Hezekiah was in at that particular time. But we knew, do know that God said for his own name's sake and for David's name's sake, he would do this. So Hezekiah, a good and godly man, almost lost his life. But God needed him to understand something. The gravity of his calling would require that he would fully lean upon God in order to be successful and to conquer the Assyrians. We get a little more clarity about this in three different passages concerning life and death. And I'm, I'm not going to read tons of, of uh, scripture, but I do want to look at these three briefly. Psalm 103, the 13th verse just as a father has compassion upon his children, so the Lord has compassion upon those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. But when the wind has passed over it, it is no more. And it, its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to their children's children. Amen? Similarly, Isaiah writes in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 6, a voice says, shout out, call out. And then he said, what shall I shout? What is the message? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades away. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And finally, Peter quotes the same scripture that we just read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. For you've been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. This, the grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. I believe that God wants us to hear six things here in particular. And he does this often when he wants us to really understand something. He will put it multiple times throughout scripture. And that's what we see in these past three uh, passages that we just 
that we just read, and I want to just look at a couple of things in each one of these six items. Flesh, meaning all people. The number of all people's days are held in his hands and is as grass. There is no difference person to person, king or pauper, rich or poor. The days of our lives on this earth are numbered by God himself. Number two, the passage in Psalm 103 says that he is mindful that we are but dust and that he has compassion on those who fear him while we live on this earth. He reminds us here that we are born, we flourish, our flower grows and is visible by all those who pass by. But then, at his appointed time, when he blows on it, our flower fades away and our flesh is like grass. It withers in mortal death. Number three, Isaiah commanded that this message be shouted out. Hear me. Notify everyone. Let all the people know this. It's going to be a short stay here on this earth. He didn't say, you can have everything you ask for. You can have everything your way. This was not the message. The message was, you might even get sick unto death, but know this, don't get settled here. Don't lay your treasure up here, for this is not your home. We are just passing through because he has something far, far better. And number four, but the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. This means that his loving kindness extends from before those who fear him get here and to those who fear him after they leave. His loving kindness does not change from before we were born of that dust and lived as a flowering grass to when we are eternally joined together with him in everlasting peace. Number five, this might be the greatest part. And his righteousness extends to the children of those who love him and do his precepts and to their children's children. As it said in verse 18, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. And finally, number six, most of all, while we heard the message shouted loud and clear that Isaiah spoke of, we understand and we know that we are temporary, that the word of the Lord endures forever. Regardless that our days here are short, regardless that we face fears and diseases and harsh elements in this world, regardless that we face even death, his word never changes, it never fails, and it endures forever. The Apostle Paul, in the final chapter of that mighty book of Hebrews, chapter 13, he told us how to live during this time, this brief time that we're here, and why we should live thusly. He said to keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Be hospitable, lest you entertain angels without even knowing it. He said, honor your marriage and be faithful in it. He said, don't love money. Be thankful and satisfied with what you have. And here's why he could say that. Because God said, I will never fail you. This is all in the 13th chapter of Hebrews. I will never abandon you. So you can always say with the greatest of confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will have no fear. What can people do to me? As Paul was wrapping up this beautiful letter to the Hebrews, he says this in verse 12. 
So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. So let us go out, outside the camp to him and bear the disgrace that he bore. For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. And verse 15, therefore let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need while you're here. These are the sacrifices that please God. So as I said, while it sounds like a bit of a depressing message to talk about such things as death and our shortness of time here on this life, in this life, and that our treasure cannot be laid up in this fleeting world because there is no hope within this world. But we know that we know that we know that our hope is not in this world. It is not in anything connected to this world. It is not in money. It is not in leadership. It's not even in health or anything else. But our hope is in his everlasting to everlasting loving kindness. When we don't even understand the things that are happening, Hezekiah didn't. He had been a good man, yet his days were numbered in God's hands. And we have total faith in believing in God's unchanging word and all of its promises. Our hope is in his compassionate knowledge that we are but dust and in a withering state. And we are utterly dependent upon him for life, for breath, and for righteousness that we gain salvation through his son. Amen. I hope you can see there was light. There was some goodness in the message. It's not all darkness because the light has overcome that darkness. Would you stand with me this morning, please? Father, we give honor to you as our creator, the one who created us, Lord, from dust, from nothing, O oh God, but you created us with a hunger and a thirst for you. And Lord, because of that, we can look to you and look beyond this grassy, flowery life that we're in right now as it begins to wane and wither and we look to that home not made with hands. Oh, that eternal home. Father, I pray that you would help us to remember not to love anything connected with this world because it is not our home. Our treasure is not here in this place. Our treasure is laid up where you have prepared a home that moth and dirt and dust cannot corrupt. Oh, can you imagine not having to dust your house and get all the dirt out because it's full of light and him. Oh, thank you. I want to ask this question. Is there anyone here who is fearful, who's, who's afraid because your days are numbered and not in your own control, but it's in the hands of God and you're not sure that you'd be ready to leave this world if your days were ending tomorrow. I want to invite you to come. And I want to ask you, Lord, to ask the Lord to take your life in his control. Give it all to him. He knows what's best for us. We just read that he has compassion because we are made of dust and we are his, he created this frame. If you're unsure where you might spend eternity, I invite you to come forward and we will pray with you that your eternity would be secure in him. If not, 
then we say, Father, we ask all these things in the matchless name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we ask, oh God, that you go with each one with the benediction of your peace and your loving kindness upon each head, upon each heart, Lord, and draw us in next week closer to you to worship your name. In Jesus' precious name we ask, amen and amen.